always hate that these get recorded too, but that's okay. Um, I'm really excited to be able to introduce Katie Knopper. Um, Katie is from Loveland, Colorado, so I feel bonded. I also grew up in Colorado, not in Loveland, but that's okay. Um, I, I remember kind of the first experience I had with Katie was in atmospheric and environmental chemistry, kind of, and you made this beautiful poster about the timeline of air pollution, and it was the first time I really realized how, how well Katie could communicate and um, just kind of sort out ideas in wonderful ways. And since then, I, I really feel like I've been privileged to see her grow through analytical and then an instrumental analysis where we really started to find this, this niche of wanting to look at kind of coding and methods and more, more large data and how to look at some of the most interesting analytical aspects, whether it be biochemistry or more related to computer science, but really on the edges of interdisciplinary work. And I could not have been more excited for her to get her um, RU that she's going to talk about for this talk out at Stanford because it allowed her to really um, find a place where the chemistry and the question really spoke to her. So I just am so proud of how you have grown and changed and I feel really privileged to have been able to work without, with you throughout your career. So I hope that you enjoy this talk because I think it's something a little bit different that you don't get to see here at Lawrence all the time and just a wonderful opportunity. Yay, Katie. Thank you. So as Dana said, my name is Katie and my presentation today is about my research at Stanford developing a contrast agent for early breast cancer detection. Um, and as a quick disclaimer, there's a lot of breasts in my presentation, but let's free the nip. <laughs> so to give you a bit of context um, behind my interest in this area of research and how I was able to participate in it. So leading into my junior year of college, several family members of mine were dealing with uh, cancer diagnoses. And so I was like, okay, well maybe the science I'm learning can help out with this. So I looked for programs um, that focused on cancer research, and I found one at Stanford called the Canary Crest Program, and they particularly focused on early detection diagnosis techniques as well as um, early stage therapeutics. So I applied during the winter term and believed, okay, I don't have much of a chance of getting this. I mean, it's at Stanford, right? <laughs> so I went abroad to London Center. In I went abroad to the London Center. And it wasn't until the end of my time there that I found out I actually got this position, and I was super excited. So I hopped on a plane and flew back to Colorado, where I'm from, and then drove out to California with one of my aunts, who had a lot of um, experience with breast cancer because she had been diagnosed with it. So we had a long conversation about her experience. Um, so while I was in California, I met a ton of amazing young women, and I also worked closely with these people all summer. This is my lab group. So on the left, this is Katie Wilson, and she was my primary mentor. And so she's an instructor in the radiology department at Stanford, and she focuses on um, the development of a novel imaging technique called photoacoustic molecular imaging. And then on the right-hand side here, this is Rakesh, and he was a graduate student that I worked with closely throughout the summer, and he loved yeast. <laughs> Um, and I had a third mentor named Lofi. He's not pictured here because he moved away in the middle of the summer, but he was, his primary focus was on protein engineering. So all of their um, strengths came together to put together this project. Um, so as I was traveling back to, or out to California, I realized I don't know all that much about breast cancer, and I started to do some research. And I found out some stuff about breast cancer statistics. So breast cancer is the most common cancer among women. And so if you are a woman and you are going to develop cancer in your lifetime, it's most likely going to be breast cancer. Um, so it's responsible, responsible for 30% of all new cancer cases. So that is around 268,600 new diagnoses in this year. And it's also the second leading cause of cancer-related mortality in women. So that's around 41,760 deaths in, this, in 2019 and that's right behind lung cancer. So next I looked into the biology of the disease because despite having breasts, I wasn't really aware of what lies underneath the top layer of skin. Um, and so I found out that breasts are known as mammary glands medically, and they're made up of lobules, which, are milk -producing, which is a milk-producing structure, and that's this stuff here. 
it forms a circle around the nipple, and it's connected to the nipple through a system of ducts. You also have a ton of lymphatic vessels which run through the breast, and these help drain excess fluid as well as bring in important immune cells to fight off inflammation and disease. But primarily, the breast is composed of fatty tissue and connective tissue, and that's that yellow, this yellow stuff here. And I also want to note that breast cancer isn't primarily affecting women. It also can affect men. Um, and their anatomy is almost identical, except they lack the lobules and ducts seen here. So what are the stages of um, breast cancer development? So the early breast cancer stages are stages 0 through 2. So stage 0 is non-invasive carcinoma in situ. And I'll go into what carcinoma in situ means in just a bit. Stage one is you have developed a tumor that's just under two centimeters in diameter, diameter and um, there's no evidence of metastasis. Stage two, um, the tumor is still localized within the breast and only ex um, extended to a nearby lymph node. The later stages of cancer are stages three and four. So cancer extend, in stage three, cancer extends beyond your immediate lymph nodes, but not to distant organs. And in stage four, cancer is spread to distant organs. In other words, it has metastasized. Um, and in the case of breast cancer, the first place that it will likely metastasize to is your lungs. So for these five stages of breast cancer, what is the five-year relative survival rate following diagnosis? So if you get diagnosed with breast cancer in its latest stage, stage four, your chances of survival are around 27% not very good. <laughs> However, if you can catch this disease in its late earlier stages, stages 0 through 1, your chances of survival are around 99%. And that's kind of the premise behind the Canary Crest program, is in funding research that focuses on diagnosing these cancers in their early stages. So what is stage 0 breast cancer? And this is primarily focused on women since men don't have these, these structures. So stage 0 can be um, divided into two types, DCIS and LCIS. DCIS stands for ductal carcinoma in situ, and that just means it's developed in the duct and remains there. <laughs> um, lobular carcinoma in situ means that it's developed in your lobes and it's, it's still ro localized there. So how do physicians currently go about screening for breast cancer? Current diagnosis techniques include mammography and ultrasound and occasionally MRIs may be used, but my primary focus is on these two techniques. So, um, despite knowing mammography was something I had to look forward to in my future, I had no idea what it entailed. And I also asked several peers of mine, and many of them didn't know either, so I found a video to demonstrate this. So, this technique works by placing the breast on a support plate and compressing it with another plate. This is necessary to reduce path length and stabilize the breast. So then when you um, shine low-dose x-rays through the breast, and it'll meet the detector down here, um, that way you get a clear image, which looks something like this, a mammogram. So a mammogram, on a mammogram, fat will appear translucent or this lighter gray color. And denser tissues, like your tumor would be, will appear this whiter. And this is like connective tissue. But this image shows one of the biggest limitations of mammography, and that's breast density. And unfortunately, breast density afflicts 50% of the women who are likely to develop, to develop breast cancer. Um, and also I want to note that mammography starts when a woman's around 40 years of age, and it's a yearly screening until you're around 55 years of age, afterwards throughout every other year. So it's a big part of a woman's life. Um, so if a physician suspects breast cancer, to, uh, yeah, that you have breast cancer or um, you have dense breasts, they'll ask you to get a diagnostic ultrasound. And this is a relatively harmless technique. So a, a physician will place jelly on your skin and then use a transducer to emit sound waves into the body where it'll hit tissue boundaries and bounce back, providing an image that looks something like this. Um, and this is a 2D image, which provides pretty good tumor visualization of big tumors. Um, but it's not going to be all that effective in the early stages of diagnosis. And also, a big limiting factor is that ultrasounds have a high rate of false positives. So this leads to unnecessary biopsies and callbacks. 
So, breast density is a major risk factor for breast cancer development, and this afflicts 50% of women. So there is a need to improve upon current imaging techniques. And the lab that I went to at Stanford was focused on photoacoustic imaging and fluorescence imaging. So what is photoacoustic molecular imaging? And I found a quick video. Or not. Okay, <laughs> well, I'll summarize it for you. So this technique uses light and sound waves to visualize tissues in the body. So near-infrared light in short 10 nanosecond pulses is, um, irradiates the tissue, and chromophores will expand and contract, releasing acoustic waves, which then can be detected by a transducer. And it, pr it produces an image that looks something like this. So you have a 2D image, um, your 2D ultrasound image, but you have better optical um, characterization of the tissues. So the other technique we focused on was fluorescence molecular imaging. And basically, a fluorophore has electrons at a stable ground state, but when we irradiate the fluorophore with a given UV wavelength, it gives the electron the energy to jump up to an excited state. There is then an internal conversion between the rotational and vibrational energy levels, and it is ultimately unstable in this state and will fall back down to the ground state, emitting a photon of lower frequency, higher wavelength in the process. And that produces a spectrum that looks something like this, with wavelength on the x-axis and light intensity on the y-axis. Absorption is um, at a lower wavelength, while your fluorescence peak is going, fluorescence emissions peak is going to be at a slightly higher wavelength. And this is what, this is the image that we can, is produced. So, some important results of prior research done by this lab at Stanford included identifying a marker on breast cancer cells which can be targeted for imaging and therapeutics. This marker is called B7H3, and it's a receptor protein on the cellular membrane. It's specifically expressed on endothelial and epithelial cells, and endothelial cells they line the interior surface of blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, while epithelial cells are a type of cell that lines the surfaces of your skin, blood vessels, urinary tract, and organs. So once they identified a marker on breast cancer cells, differentially expressed on breast can okay, <laughs> differentially expressed on breast cancer cells, they decided to target it. And so they created an antibody ICG contrast agent to aid in tumor visualization using photoacoustics and fluorescence molecular imaging. And so for those of you who aren't aware, an antibody is an important component of your immune system, and it has the capacity to, to bind to targets with high affinity. And ICG is just one of the fluorophores. Um, so to help visualize this, I created an, I came up with an analogy. <laughs> and so if you think about Velcro, um, and you consider that this B7H3 marker is kind of like the base of Velcro, and so your cell is covered in it, and this, the antibody is more like the hooks, and so they bind to each other with high affinity, and these scientists, what they've done is glued a mirror on top of the um, hooks of the Velcro, and so that way, when we shine light at it, we can identify our cell, and so then when you're looking at a large <laughs> pool of cells, normal and cancerous, you can actually find your cancer cell. So what are the disadvantages to this? Well, antibodies are expensive to produce, and they can cause an immune response in humans. So our research goal then is to create a contrast agent for photoacoustic and fluorescence molecular imaging that is inexpensive to produce, won't induce a large immune response, and targets breast cancer cells with high specificity and sensitivity. And we thought, we considered doing this with an afibody. So what is an afibody? It's a three helical structure derived from the Z domain of Staphylococcus or its protein A, and a yeast library may be used to engineer a binding ligand for a desired target. And this is a really cool technique because it allows us to engineer proteins which bind to targets with high affinity. Um, and I don't know all that much about this because the University of Minnesota actually did this for us. Um, so an acrobody is pretty small, it's around 7 kilodaltons. It has fast tumor infiltration, a low immune response, um, it's stable in a wide range of physiological pH and temperatures, and it's cost effective for large scale production. 
So the next step to creating a contrast agent is deciding what fluorophore to use. And we decided to use in this dye green, um, abbreviated ICG. And this is the molecule here. As you can see, it's highly conjugated. And so it's an FDA approved near infrared fluorescent dye. Um, and it's pretty small, around 818 Daltons. And it absorbs primarily between 600 and 900 nanometers and fluoresces then between 750 and 950 nanometers. So now we need to figure out how we're gonna create this contrast agent. And this can be divided into two main synthesis steps. Alpha-body production and then alpha-body dye conjugation. And then we need to characterize it using nanodrop UV vis, SDS page, and MALDI TOF. And I'll go into what these mean later. <laughs> so first of all, afterbody production. This was pretty simple. It was done in three steps. Um, cloning, expression, and purification. So in the cloning step, we need to choose an appropriate plasmid. And a plasmid is just a circular piece of bacterial DNA. Um, then we insert a construct. And a construct is a gene of interest, whatever you want the bacteria to produce for you. Um, then we transform it in E. coli, that E. coli to grow it, um, and then we purify it. So we did this using FPLC, which is called fast protein liquid chromatography, and using a spin desalting column. So cloning, how does this work? So you have your bacterial plasmid, and typically it has a gene for antibiotic resistance. In our case, I know this is ampicillin, but in our case, ours, um, we use canamycin. And then you also have a promoter region or a regulatory region, and we have the LAC operon and a restriction site. And so you can use restriction enzymes and cut open your plasmid and insert a gene of interest. And then, so for ours, we had a PET24B plasmid containing our B7H3 alpha body sequence and also a C-terminal six-time histag sequence. And what just, this means um, that we had six histidines um, linked together, and this is valuable in our purification process. We also had resistance to canamycin, like I said, and that lack operon. So next step is expression. And um, first of all, we transform the plasmid into the E. coli, and that just means the E. coli can take up our plas the plasmid and then we grow that bacteria on a plate supplemented with canamycin. So that way only the E. coli that has taken up our plasmid should survive. So next, we choose a couple of these colonies to incubate in a lysogeny broth. And a lysogeny broth um, is a super nutrient rich um, media that are, well, we can grow a ton of E. coli then. Um, and then we incubate until an optical density of 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and that just means we shine a light through the solution, and as once we get to the right <laughs> um, optical density, then we have a good amount of bacteria to work with. And then we induce transcription using IPTG, um, and that just, uh, it looks for that black operon promoter and allows our um, the E. coli to produce our alpha body in large quantities. So now we have E. coli with our alpha body in large quantities inside of them. So we need to get rid of the cellular membrane. And so first of all, we did this by cell lysis in um, a lysis buffer, and we hit it with these really high-powered sound waves, and that breaks it open. And so now we're left with a solution of broken up cellular debris. So how do we separate this? Um, we use a centrifugation technique, and luckily our alpha body is insoluble, so we can keep the supernatant. Then we run that supernatant um, through a column using FPLC, and our column was uh, had high affinity to histidine, so we could trap our alpha body within the column and then elude it later. But we're still left with some fragmented um, proteins. So we, we used a spin desalting column with the molecular weight caught it, cut off of three kilodaltons, so that way we only maintain our alpha body of seven kilodaltons in size. Lastly, we need to assess the quality of our purified solution, and we did this using a UV vis technique called nanodrop. So, after we've successfully created a lot of alpha body, the next step in creating a contrasted agent is binding a fluorophore to it. 
And so we used, as I mentioned earlier, we decided to use ICG dye. And part of the reason we did this is because it's clinically translatable and already safe to use in humans. So what's the chemistry look like behind this? Um, so we start out with our endocytin green dye with um, an NHS, NHS ester attached to it. And our alpha body was engineered to have a lot of lysine residues. So that way, um, this amine group could attack the carbonyl group, and we're left with a stable conjugate as well as an NHS leaving group. Um, so this was a pretty simple reaction. We just combined the two in a tube as long and with sodium bicarbonate buffer. And we allowed it to react for two hours, shaking um, and it's, uh, we covered it with tin foil so it wasn't exposed to any light. And that's a pretty simplified uh, reaction, but <laughs> it's good. Okay, so now that we've produced large quantities of our alpha body and we've conjugated it to a fluorophore, we need to characterize this. And we did this using Nanodrop UV-Viz, SDS page, and a mass spectrometry technique called MALDI-TOF. So Nanodrop UV-Viz, um, this is what it looks like. And you, your sample goes on this little dot in the middle of the black here. And it only requires around micro, one microliter of sample, which is pretty great. Um, so it relies on Beer's law. That's absorbance equals molar absorptivity times path length time co times concentration. And this is the, what, inside, this is what's happening. Um, you have a light source, which is emitting a wavelength, a UV wavelength at one wavelength, and then it goes through your sample, reflects off a mirror, and comes back down and hits a detector. In this way, we can measure the absorbance and get a spectrum that looks something like this. So, the peaks I want you to pay attention to here are at 280 nanometers, and this is a protein peak. And so, our alpha body um, contains amino acids such as phenylalanine and tryptophan, and they're, they have these um, planar conjugated structures, um, and so, oh, and then I also want you to pay attention to the ICG dye peaks at 680 and 400 nanometers. Um, and these are just characteristic of ICG here. So, our alpha body, without anything conjugated to it, is this blue line, and we'd expect to only see a protein peak, and that's what we see here at 280 nanometers, so that's good. Um, and then, we ran, we took the absorbance of our ICG NHS, and it should mostly just have its own character, and that's good. And so our conjugate of B7H3 alpha body and the ICG should be a mixture and represent both of these things. And it does a pretty good job of representing ICG, but it's hard to tell with this alpha body peak. Um, so it might just be very dilute, uh, ICG, we don't know, so we need to do some more work. And so we did SDS page. And what this is, um, it's a technique that allows us to check for sample purity and separate proteins based on charge and size. And so SDS is a detergent which denatures or unfolds the proteins and it binds, to the, it binds to them to give them a negative charge and create uniformity in structure. So now they're, they're not in their folded structure, they're straight and we can compare them. Um, and this other important part is polyacrylamide gel and that forms this polymer here. And that'll kind of catch all these heavier proteins so that they take a longer time to move down. Um, and lastly, we apply an electric current and that's called electrophoresis. So now these negatively charged proteins will move towards this positively charged cathode. And it looks something like this. So we get clear bands based on size and charge. So this is our results. So in setting up our gel, we loaded a ladder in the first lane. And a ladder is a standard solution with proteins of known molecular weights and kilodaltons. And we soaked the gel in Kumasi blue stain which can bind to proteins, so that way we can visualize these clear bands as they migrate down. In our second lane, we loaded our B7H3 alpha body. And this is a good result, because we expect the, the alpha body to be around 7 kilodaltons in size, and so that lines up appropriately with the latter. In the next two lanes, we, we, ran, our B7H we ran our contrast agent. Um, and luckily, oops, and on this right-hand side, we scanned it using fluorescence, in, fluorescence imaging. 
And luckily, we see two bands that are slightly heavier than our afibody peak. So that suggests that we have some conjugation occurring. However, we also realized our purification process following, following um, binding the ICG to the alpha body wasn't quite great. <laughs> it wasn't great yet because we have a lot of um, free ICG here. But it is still a good result because we have our alpha body and we appear to have some conjugation. So the last technique we used for characterization was called maldi tof mass spectrometry. And this stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight. <laughs> and basically what happens, you irradiate your sample, or well, you load your sample on a matrix that's on this metal plate. And then you irradiate your sample with a um, short laser pulse of nitrogen gas, which is at a wavelength of 237 nanometers. And this causes our sample to ionize. And then it's, um, it comes up here through this electrostatic field and separates based on size and hits this ion detector at the top. And this is what a spe um, your spectrum looks like. So you have mass to charge ratio on the x-axis and percent intensity on the y-axis. And this is a good result as far as we have our alpha body that's been effectively produced because we see a peak here at um, 7,000. Uh, and we expect it to be about around seven kilodaltons. So now that we believe we've created something, <laughs> uh, we moved on to a biodistribution study. And this took place near the end of my time. So it was kind of a quick run through. <laughs> and more work still should be done on this. So to start off, um, biodistribution is a method of tracking where compounds of interest travel throughout the body. So in order to achieve an effective level of contrast agent in the target tissue, the agent must transition from the circulating blood to the tissue of interest and bind to its molecular target. So this study allows us to quantify the localization of contrast agent in different areas of the body. So we did this using a transgenic mouse model. And this means that we are genet we, they were genetically altered to develop breast cancer. Um, and this is good because it provides us with a more realistic genesis of the disease. So, we ran the experiment on both tumor positive mice and these trans and transgene negative control mice, and each mouse has around 10 mammary glands, and that's shown here, five on either side of their body. Um, so we did a 33 microgram intravenous tail vein injection, which um, injects it directly in the bloodstream, and we imaged these mice over a 48 hour time period using a fluorescent scanner. And after 48 hours, we removed the organs and imaged them alone, and that's kind of what this is representing, uh, so we could better see accumulation in specific organs. Um, so, as I said early, the, earlier, these were preliminary studies. Um, so where we were trying to see if this contrast agent even functions as we hoped it would in a biological system, and whether it's actually binding to that B7H3 molecular target, as we had hoped. So, this is an example of our fluorescence imaging results. In these images, the strength of signal is denoted by the colored bar on the right. This is right here. And so a stronger signal is yellow, whereas a less strong signal is this darker, deep red color. Um, we looked at the signal primarily, primarily in the liver and bowel because these are the first and last points of clearance from the body. And we also were hoping to see good localization within the mammary tissues. On the mice, this would be a signal um, here. So the mammary tissues are, they have three under each of their arms and two just above either of their legs. And so in these earlier time points, we're primarily seeing signal in the liver and the bowel, and the liver. <laughs> and then in these later time points, we start to see signal more profuse throughout the body. And on the top, you're seeing the normal mice, and on the bottom, you're seeing these tumor mice. So at these later time points, um, these at eight hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours, we begin to see a difference in signal strength and localization. So we see a strong signal in the liver here, and a, not quite as strong. And that might be because it's B7H3 
being retained within the mammary glands there. So lastly, we remove the organs and the mice of the mice and image them specifically to assess the localization within the mammary tissues and possible other areas of localization. So this image is great to look at and make some assumptions about results, but we should better quantify this data. So we created some graphs. <laughs> um, so in this first plot, we are looking at the average fluorescent signal within the mammary tissue of tumor positive mice compared to our negative control. The x-axis is the different time points at which we image the mice, and the y-axis is the normalized radiant efficiency, which can be thought of as the amount of fluorescent signal. What this plot reveals to us is that normal mice do not show a significant increase in fluorescent signal in mammary glands. However, the difference between the breast tumor signals compared to normal glands was significant at these later time points, starting at eight hours. So, when I first saw this, I questioned, I questioned why, why do we see an increase in the signal of normal mice at all? And the answer to this is that the signal within the liver was so strong at these time points that it caused this, to read, this read to be higher. Um, so we had a really high background signal and couldn't get a clear uh, image of the mammary glands. So overall, this is a promising result, and our contrast agent does appear to be binding with the mammary, mammary tissue, but it doesn't have as strong a signal as we had hoped for, because it can't overpower that liver signal. So next, in this next plot, the x and y axis remain the same, where the x represents, sorry, <laughs> where the x represents our time points, and the y is our average radiant efficiency. Sorry. <laughs> So in this plot, we quantify the fluorescent signal within the liver. And the liver is one of the largest organs in the body and plays an important role in removing toxins and waste products from the bloodstream. So the contrast agent we injected localized within the liver early on and may be eliminated, may be, elim oh. <laughs> may be eliminated or metabolized here. So what we see here is that the normal mice have a peak in liver signal at the two hour time point, And the normal mice is denoted by this red line whereas the tumor positive mice don't have a peak until the four hour time point. So this suggests that the contrast agent is being caught up or slowed down on its way to the liver. So lastly, this plot is, a complementary, is complementary to the last plot because it quantifies the fluorescent signal in the bowel. And the bowel is going to be one of the last points within the body where we see, see signal before it is excreted. Therefore, we don't want to see signal in the bowel too early on in the tumor positive mice because that would indicate much of the agent was quickly metabolized, excreted from the body, and didn't bind to the breast cancer tissue with high affinity. So, this, so in this plot, we see that the agent accumulates to the bowel much more quickly in the normal mice, which this is good because it suggests the alpha body isn't getting held up by anything. In the tumor positive mice, the signal is much lower and doesn't change as rapidly as in the normal mice. This suggests that the agent is being retained within the mammary glands or other tissues presenting B7H3. So this is all pretty good, but we want even more proof that the contrast agent is being localized within the mammary glands. And so lastly, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so lastly, we did an ex vivo biodistribution study. So we carefully removed the organs and placed them on a special black background in this configuration, which mirrors what they would look like in the body. So we imaged them and our result is a bar graph with the different organs on the x-axis and the fluorescent signal on the y-axis. Our sample size is pretty small. We only imaged one tumor mouse and one normal mouse, each with 10 mammary glands. This primary focus was to see if there was a signal within the mammary tissue of the tumor positive mice and no, pos and no fluorescent signal within the normal mice. Luckily, this is the case. The tumor positive mice have a fluorescent signal, whereas the normal mice showed only background fluorescence, um, background level fluorescence. So overall, this contrast agent seems to work in the animal model, which is good. So in summary, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related mortality in women, but if the disease can be caught in its early stages, survivability is significantly improved. Current imaging techniques are insufficient for women with dense breasts, and that's approximately 50% of the population. Um, current research is focused on developing these photoacoustic and fluorescence molecular imaging techniques so that they may be moved to the clinic. And we created a clinically translatable alpha body fluorescent dye contrast agent 
that can differentiate between diseased and healthy mammary tissue by both photoacoustics and fluorescence molecular imaging. So some potential future research might include creating an alpha body which binds breast cancer cells with even greater affinity, um, and also maybe trying out other dyes besides ICG. And also, we had a binding ratio that was pretty small, so we could only bind around one ICG per alpha body, and I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, but if you can improve that somehow, that could be pretty effective too. So I'd like to acknowledge my mentors at Stanford, Katie Wilson, Rakesh, and Lotfi, and my mentors at Lawrence, who helped put together this presentation with me, Deanna, Kim, Allison, David, Daniel. I have Daniel because lab. <laughs> Um, and I also want to acknowledge the Canary Crest Program at Stanford and the National Health Institute for sponsoring this research. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. 